so I went to sleep for a minute. <laughs> welcome to Lake Talksway United Methodist Church and this service of worship. Um, I first want to welcome Sarah Moser. Most of you know Sarah because she's been with us in worship um, a number of times. Her daughter, Jenny Moser, has um, sung for us uh, a, numer a number of times, especially on Christmas Eve and other services. And Sarah is a keyboardist, so she's going to be playing our keyboard as well as playing the organ. You remember when we bought the instrument, we bought a nice quality uh, console keyboard, and so it's really wonderful to get the chance to um, use that keyboard. And I want to brag a little bit about it. Sarah says it's the best electronic keyboard she's ever played on. So good for us. And... Um, we appreciate those people, Sarah, like you, who are willing to help us out during Ruth's illness. Also, I would remind you, by instruction of Ruth, that the devotional guides are in the narthex and in the fellowship hall. So if you use the devotional guides, please pick them up and uh, use them. I know this has been a difficult week for many of us, and we will talk about that during prayer time, but are there any other announcements that need to be made? Ed. I'd like to thank uh, those of you that joined us yesterday for the work day in Memorial Garden. A lot was accomplished, and uh, the church uh, appreciates it. Thank you very much. Will you stand as we share in the greeting? Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing a song of peace and hope. Sing to the Lord a song of strength. Our strength is in the Lord of hosts. Sing to the Lord a song of joy. Our song is a song of service and faithfulness. And our hymn of praise is hymn number 103. Please be seated.
And let us continue as we pray the corporate prayer that you find uh, printed in the bulletin. Lord of the vineyard, we ask for your presence and your guidance. In your holy wisdom, tend the vines of our hearts, teach us your righteousness, that our lives may flower with justice. We come as wild grapes, yearning to grow fruitful in your love. Show us the way through Jesus, your Son, to discern your will, hear your word, and grow in your ways as we deepen the roots of our faith. Amen. You have the appointed scripture passages in the bulletin in front of you. I invite you to follow along as together we read and hear the uh, appointed lessons for this day. The first lesson, the Old Testament lesson, comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Um, Jeremiah um, was a prophet under King Josiah. And King Josiah, if you know anybody who named their child or their son Josiah, um, it's because they hoped their son would be a reformer, a good person. Because Josiah was a reforming king, and Jeremiah was a prophet during his time. The people who had strayed, uh, King Josiah had brought the people back and, and guided them into godliness. And Jeremiah speaks, uh, we're reading the beginning of the book of Jeremiah, typical of the call of a prophet. God calls to the prophet. The prophet gives a resistance typical of humans, isn't it, that we give a reason, and Jeremiah's reason is, I'm too young and I don't speak well, and then um, Jeremiah ultimately um, receives the call that is given to him. So let us give attention to this lesson. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. And I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I, Jeremiah, said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, do not be afraid of them, Jeremiah, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Herein ends the reading of the Old Testament lesson, and I need to borrow somebody's insert because there weren't very many, and I realized I didn't want, um, y'all have got one to share. I'll read the Psalter lesson from right down here so I can give it back to Fred. Our Psalter lesson is from Psalm 71, and we will read it responsively. I've taken refuge in you, Lord. Don't let me ever be put to shame. And be my rock of refuge where I can always escape. You commanded that my life be saved because you are my rock and my fortress. My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked. Rescue me from the grip of all the oppressor. Because you are my hope, Lord. You, Lord, are the one I've trusted since childhood. <clears throat> And the epistle lesson this morning comes from uh, the book of Hebrews, which we've been reading in now for a few weeks, chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. Um, the writer of Hebrews has been contrasting the making of the old and the new covenants of God with his people. 
You remember the old covenant was made at Mount Sinai. Moses was the one who received that covenant. And remember at least the second time because you remember there was an initial time where the people built a golden calf. So it was Moses returned to the mountain. And for the second time, as Moses came down from the mountain, the people were, were filled with awe. They were filled with a sense of amazement. There was even some fear in the people, probably because of what had happened when the covenant had been made for the first time. So here the writer of Hebrews says the new covenant or the fulfillment, I should say, of the covenant that is made in Jesus Christ, it brings joy. So you'll note that is a theme here in this lesson that we hear from the 12th chapter of Hebrews. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. I just want to stop there because I like to teach occasionally since I don't get to teach much. That's the writer of Hebrews referring to the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, I should say. Remember, written on, on tablets and there was fire along with that. So you have not come to something that can be touched or a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. It's another word to say joyful gathering. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? And at that time his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. And this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Will you please stand for the reading of the gospel? The gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 17. Jesus heals a woman on the Sabbath. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood still up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox 
or his donkey from the uh, manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And when he said this, all his opponents were put to shame. And the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation, hymn number 430. Please be seated. And let us pray. O oh God, we come seeking to hear your word, to praise your name, and to find that we are a people blessed by the gift of your love. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So some of you know what the lectionary is. Some of you don't. It's those four texts we just read. And it's been around for a long, long time. In fact, some scholars believe that even in the synagogue uh, worship. That there was a reading from the Torah which would have been the first five books. Then there would have been a reading, they believe, from the writings, which uh, would have included some, depending on how you want to term it, but the prophets, those kinds of books. And then a reading from the Psalms, which is a 
different kind of literature, as you know, more like a hymn. Um, in fact, many scholars believe when you read about that story of Jesus and his first message at the uh, synagogue in his hometown, and he read from Isaiah that it was actually an appointed text to be read that day, that he didn't choose it, it was an appointed text. And if you think about scrolls and the way they would have had them, it makes sense that you would have the scroll kind of rolled out and keep moving it forward. So that kind of makes sense. And then when uh, we became the Christian church, um, there were lessons appointed. The idea is that over three years, all the major parts of the Bible are read out loud in church. So for those of you who've never read the Bible, if you come to church every single Sunday for three years, you'll get the majority of the Bible read out loud to you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Um, but the other thing, sometimes you can see a theme that is pulled together in the four texts, and sometimes the four themes seem totally unrelated. It's especially true during the season of what we know as the season after Pentecost or the common time, that oftentimes the four texts don't seem to have any connection to each other. But this morning, at least I, as I read and prepared, saw a connection between uh, these uh, four texts. It's interesting to me, the first text that kind of grabbed my attention, believe it or not, was the epistle lesson. Um, there's a syntax. Is there, there's some English teachers here. I know at least one, and there's some others of you who claim to know something about grammar, right, and public speaking. So the syntax and the cadence of what we read in Hebrews is quite difficult. And I've mentioned to you already that the Greek that we find in Hebrews is among the best written in that language. And so it's difficult for the syntax and the cadence, but then even more difficult is the context of this passage of Scripture because it says if the writer where it, the rest of Hebrews has been put in so beautifully in an argument or a, an apologetic, whatever you want to call it. And remember, I told you it's a book where we believe the writer was writing to a group of Christians who were thinking about leaving the church. And it kind of feels like this passage is just dropped into the middle of an ongoing discussion about the retelling because remember we've been saying by faith the last two Sundays we've read that by faith so it was a retelling of the Hebrew story and then right here in the middle we drop this text in here um, referring to an awe-inspiring display of God's presence and power as Yahweh descends from Mount Sinai in the fourth and fifth chapters of Deuteronomy. That's the passage of scripture where Moses is coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments in hand. And yet, when you look at those verses in Hebrews that immediately precede these verses, you realize that today's reading is the beginning of a new thought, a new argument, a new pattern in the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews would expect that the audience to whom he was writing was well acquainted with the history of the Hebrews and that there is no explanation or context needed. It was simply necessary to remind the people of how God appeared at Mount Sinai to Moses and how then, in contrast with God's arrival at Mount Sinai, remember there was that warning that wasn't far behind? Because if the people decide to reject the voice of God, and even in Hebrews the writer is saying, here's the warning, if you decide to reject the sound of the voice of God in Jesus, in the Holy Spirit, then you will be removed with those created things that will be shaken. 
So the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't be shaken. We are supposed to be unshaken. And then we move to that, to this terse interchange, if you will, in the gospel lesson with a synagogue leader. And how do those two, by the way, correlate in any way? Do they? There's that cautionary note in the lesson from Hebrews. Well, look at the lesson or the story of Jesus and the leader of the synagogue and what transpires as a result of the healing of that crippled woman. Do you know what the fourth commandment is? Oh, somebody knows what the fourth commandment is, please. Well, I'm going to tell you, so now nobody's spoken out because everybody's afraid of being wrong, just like I would be, by the way. The fourth commandment is the commandment about the Sabbath. Now, do you remember that commandment? What is it? Remember? There you go. It was a sacred day set aside for an observant Jew for worship and for rest. And there were strict rules that governed acceptable activities performed on the Sabbath. It was a 24-hour period from sundown on Friday, what you and I call Friday at least, Friday evening till sundown on Saturday evening. And over the centuries, teachers of the law had developed a spoken and then ultimately it was codified or written down. That's a nice way for, that's my seminary word for written down, codified. So you know I have a little education, <laughs> just a little. Anyway, then that, all of that interpretation got written down. And so there were all of these Rules, if you will, and that's the best way probably to describe them, about what was acceptable to do on the Sabbath. And basically, the idea of all those rules and of the Ten Commandments was that there was to be a cessation of all activity of anything that was considered work by the religious authorities. And the crux of the Sabbath prohibition of work is found either in Deuteronomy 20, which is where the Ten Commandments is also recorded, the Ten Commandments. When you and I quote the Ten Commandments, it's from there. But also Deuteronomy chapter 5. And I suspect some of you, like I grew up in homes where there were certain guidelines that we kept on Sundays. You know the Christian tradition moved the day of worship to the first day of the week because of the resurrection. But what were some of those uh, prohibitions that were oral? They weren't written down anywhere, but they were oral, and I knew them. You yell them out. What were some prohibitions you lived with? Don't go to White Lake on Sunday. So you couldn't go... Boating, swimming, having fun at a lake. Don't go to the movies. That was one I grew up with. I remember when I broke that one. <laughs> I was 16. I broke it at age 16 and did not tell my parents. <laughs> What's another one you grew up with? No alcohol. No alcohol on Sunday. You remember when you couldn't even purchase it and they had it all uh, in the grocery store? It would all be um, roped off all day long. Couldn't play ball of any kind. That was enough. No cards. That was one in, I remember in college playing cards on a Sunday evening and thinking, oh, I have broken a very important commandment because here I am playing spades on um, Sunday. It was after sundown, you're right. You, I've just done that to say to you, so we carried on that tradition and I actually 
had some regret that we probably don't practice Sabbath quite as seriously as we should today because we have profaned, every, we've made the day of worship as profane as any other day or maybe I should say just as ordinary as any other day and it's not set aside and made as important at, as perhaps it ought to be. In Jesus' day, you couldn't even light a fire. Yeah, and remember how important lamps would be? So if your lamp went out, you were in trouble. You did not light a fire. There were 39 kind of prohibitions like that that were essential basically to your daily existence, and yet you could not do those things. So this prohibition that the leader of the synagogue is referring to was not some flip or casual expectation. It was related to the sacred nature of the Sabbath, which was expected to be preserved at all cost. And yet, as Jesus heals, and it wasn't the first time, by the way, yet again on the Sabbath, there's a distinction drawn between the accepted view of the religious officials and the thousands of years of theological interpretation. By the way, when I said perhaps we have made the Sabbath to be just as routine as any other day, do you know that one of the required responsibilities of the Jews for the Sabbath was to attend worship at the synagogue. That was a requirement to attend worship at the synagogue because in the time of Jesus, as you know, the, after the disbursement of Jews, it came back, the synagogue became the center of religious teaching. The temple existed for another purpose and another reason. So this woman in the story today has gone to some kind of Herculean effort to get to the synagogue. Can you imagine how she struggled with her debilitating physical condition to make it to the synagogue that day? And you walked everywhere you went. And how difficult would it have been for her to have come back to the synagogue another day if Jesus had announced, come back on Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. and I will perform a service of healing. Which makes the case that we have to be careful in making sure that we make space and don't create obstacles to those with special needs or different needs than us who want to get to worship. Well, throughout the Gospels, Jesus manages to get himself in trouble over and over and over, and many times related to Sabbath regulations and Sabbath healing in particular. Jesus kind of draws a line, if you will, in the sand, confronts this religious leader and other religious leaders and other stories who rebuke him, and he lays claim to a higher commandment, that of the two great commandments of which Jesus speaks in the 22nd chapter of Matthew, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And by indicating the kind of effort it takes to unbind the livestock so that they could continue to live and get a drink, Jesus points to the care that God has taken for this woman by unbinding her from her physical illness so that she might fully live. 
is clear, to me at least, how easily many in Jesus' time might become overzealous in their observance of the Sabbath. I always used to think my mother's family was overzealous in their observance of the Sabbath because you were not allowed to raise your voice on the Sabbath. And I remember being at my mother's family's home, their farm, on the Sundays. And literally, as a child, you'd have to do this to hear any spoken word. And they spoke as few words as possible because that was a part of their tradition. You just didn't talk about mundane things on Sunday. If you were speaking, you were supposed to speak about religious things. And they spoke so softly, I remember thinking, I'm going to lose it. Please let me go outside. <laughs> Jesus lays claim to that which the writer of Hebrews is speaking about. Because for many, the Sabbath might be thought of as one of the things that cannot be shaken and it very truly is. But the Jesus healing of the crippled woman and his admonition to the synagogue leader indicates that those things that are done in service for others for God's glory and purpose are to be done whenever and wherever they are needed, even on the Sabbath. Jesus seems to be saying with each of the incidences of his Sabbath work that when we have the opportunity, regardless of when or where it is, we are to do the work that we are given to do to heal, to welcome, to love, to encourage, to serve. And the author of Hebrews warns us in verse 25 not to refuse the one, and that would be the capital one, O-N-E, capital O, who is speaking. For that one is about to shake heaven and earth and those things will be removed that are able to be shaken. But we are also reminded that we are followers of Christ. And that we are inheritors of a kingdom that is unshakable. And the unshakable kingdom is built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And his establishment, his fulfillment of the covenant is based not simply on obedience to a set of rules but on engaged and inspired reactions to the great love of the one God and it is this it is to this one God that we are invited to come and to join in the celebration of the angels in the heavenly Jerusalem it is to this God this one God that we give thanks and worship and honor and glory. I have to tell you, I get a little frustrated with some of the contemporary expressions of worship where it feels like it's a concert to tickle our noses, human noses, rather than the expression being worship directed solely to the one loving, eternal God. I'm not saying that contemporary expressions are not needed and perhaps, in fact, in many places they are uh, lively, but it is 
concerning that we all should ask ourselves, when we come, are we directing our worship to the one unshakable God of love, God of mercy, God of grace, God of healing, God of reconciliation. Because we are called to be in relationship with that God and to be involved in the powerful acts of the healing nature of God that binds us to an understanding that nothing we do is separate from that unshakable, unwavering love made visible to us on the cross and established or fulfilled in the covenant that Jesus escorted in by his death and re resurrection. We're invited to show the power of God to all people. We're invited to gather and worship in unity. In a unity that is created by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in our hymns, which are prayers, in our praise this day, we reconnect to the power of God made available to us. And receiving that, we're asked to give it away, to share it. Take note today, for whatever reason, of those who are not with us. We've experienced a tragic death this week. I'm aware somebody was with us last Sunday that has joined the church triumphant today. Many of you are too. As I always referred to her as Little Patty. Take a look. Ruth is not with us today because she is sick. Take a look at others who are not with us. And use the power that is granted by God's grace to make sure that family, that individual, those other individuals feel the healing love that God has for them. And God forgive me as I brag on you for just a few moments. You, many of you, have gone above and beyond in this past week to minister God's grace and God's love, especially to Ruth. And as I thought about the sermon and what I wanted to say, and I said, oh, thank you, God, for letting me have this these scriptures to kind of weave this in. I'm confessing this is my weaving in of my pastoral statement to you. But it fits very well, does it not? Okay, if it doesn't, you just keep it to yourself. <laughs> you, this congregation, this community reaches out in love and compassion, especially to each other. And you do it willingly, and it costs a lot. Because to provide for someone else's needs requires us to exert some energy. And I know it, and I honor it, because that's a demonstration of you coming to worship the powerful God of love and healing and then going out and sharing it. May we do it for Patty's family. May we do it for others in this community. 
And may we continue to do it as we serve in the larger community by giving of our resources to Christian agencies that serve those who are homeless, those who are hungry, those who are unwed mothers. May we do it as we reach out in love to students saying we know the cost of education is expensive and we want to support you and assist you. May we allow ourselves to be consumed by God's love. And rather than catch ourselves caught in complaint, may we find ourselves consumed with love and joining with the crowd that witnesses to the Sabbath work of healing and rejoice at all the wonderful things that God is still doing. And God forgive me because I've been frustrated this past week at times with you know who. But many of you have been in ministry with me to say, whoa, 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 we'll take it. We can handle it. We can do it. And that is what we should all rejoice about is the work of healing and the work of love that happens on Sabbath. And yes, the wonderful things that Christ continues to do in our community. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen and Amen. Will you take your hymnals, turn in the back to page number 889. We will use that as our statement of faith. It is taken from 1 Timothy. Will you stand as together we affirm what we believe? Number 889. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. So I come this morning sharing just a few concerns um, and some notices. Ruth last night called me several times, but one of her phone calls was to, um, she wants to make sure I did everything right today. And I think Carol Guffey is appointed to go home and tell her how, whether I did okay and how Sarah did. Um, I know she's appointed to go to the chapel and do that. And I think Carol was just being nice and not telling me she's appointed to do that today too. Um, but Ruth wanted me to express to you how much she has appreciated all the things that you have done for her in this past week. Food, uh, providing her with transportation, staying with her. Um, she is truly appreciative. Some of you who have been with her know that she um, is quite emotional as she speaks about that. So I uh, pass not my appreciation along now, but her appreciation. Also, would encourage you to continue to send cards. We think just sending them to her post office box here, which is P.O. Box 87, um, and someone can check that post office box and get the cards to her. Um, because we do, many of you know, you've read the prayer line. We believe she will be getting to Tories, um, hopefully on Tuesday, and be there. 
Uh, also, um, I would you know that she does not need food any longer, um, and thank you for those who have done that. Um, many of us do not know Ruth's financial situation, so if you are desire if you have a desire to help, um, please, Fred um, Markets, our chair of our administrative council, and he's been involved with me, so we know the cost of what her care is going to be. So if you're wanting to help, please see us and we can help uh, direct you with that. But you don't need to feel pressure to do that either. Also, um, this morning, I uh, would ask that um, we need to remember to be in prayer for Sally Steinmeier. One of you came in this morning mentioning that um, Sally, some of you know, has been dealing for some time with an illness that um, has been a great um, challenge. And so she's... I believe rehospitalized at Shands probably in Gainesville, and she and Ted need our prayers. Um, also, um, I would encourage us to be in prayer for uh, Patty McDonough's family, um, and I'm saying that last name a little incorrectly. I know um, I, w I never could quite get it right. Um, some of you I know I are going to the service on Wednesday in Atlanta. But we were Patty's summer congregation, and she attended faithfully. I, she never missed a service uh, that I can remember during the summers. Um, also, if some of you are going to that service, um, would you reach out to each other and offer rides? Louise Spencer, in particular, is hoping to find a ride uh, with someone. Are there any other needs that you would like to call out in prayer before we come to the time of prayer? This morning we're going, because nobody can find, I haven't yet been able to get that music from Ruth for the chorus that we always sing. So instead this morning we're going to turn in our hymnals to page number 496 and sing the first verse of Sweet Hour of Prayer. And I am going to encourage you, Ruth kind of wanted to come to worship today because she wanted us to lay hands on her. Um, we probably will try to set that up uh, in the next week or so. But in reflection of that, we simply can come to the altar right now. And those of you who would like to lay hands on her, you can come to the altar and kneel and use this as a time that we are praying specifically for her as well as those other situations I have named. So let us prepare to pray. God, you call us to worship you and to recognize you are the source of authentic power, of grace, forgiveness, and of authentic healing. So we have gathered at this altar and gathered in our seats and focus our attention especially on Ruth 
praying that you would give to her a complete healing. That you would touch not only her physical body, but also her emotional, her spiritual, and her financial situation. And that you would give her that continued rock-solid faith that you will provide for her and meet her needs. We pray for Sally Steinmeier and Ted. We pray for Patty's family as we pray for ourselves in our shock and our grief. Oh God, we ask that you would also hear the names of others that we now name from our seats and from this altar. For all those that need prayer and that some that we know but have asked that we hold their needs quietly. And for all those we carry privately in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer as we continue as Christ taught us when we pray to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we continue as our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and our offerings.
and let us pray. Thank you, Lord God, that you have called us into the flock of Jesus. Make us like our good shepherd so that we have compassion on people, helping them in their needs and leading them to Jesus. Use us and our possessions in your service. Amen. And our closing hymn is hymn number 580. God. 